Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and I'm super pumped to be introducing this brand new series we're about to kick off all around the three P's of Plan Produce Profit. Now, the XY team spent a lot of time thinking about what makes a great financial advice offering, a great financial advice business and what we distilled it down to was that there are three key elements that you need to get right to have any level of success in your financial planning business. The first is about planning and how to plan an epic service proposition that's engaging for the people that you want to work with and compelling to drive real results within your business. The second is about producing and that's about being efficient in your business, streamlining things, maximizing benefits of technology to uh, run a a scalable and uh, profitable advice service. And then the third is profit, which is all about getting your message out to a bigger market how do you attract more people into this awesome offer that you're running efficiently and scalably? So I'm taking over over the next 15 episodes. We're going to have 15 advisors, going to be 100% advisors. I've had a bunch of fun with the recordings that I've done so far, the interviews, and, uh, and I've got a few more great ones to come. So I hope you enjoy this series. This episode is proudly sponsored by FE Analytics. Now, a number of XY advisors have already discovered this one-stop easy to use tool that helps with investment research, analysis, portfolio construction, ongoing monitoring, and client reporting. Find out how FE Analytics can help you improve your business process, manage your existing client base, and win new business by contacting Bruce Jenner via bruce.jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R, at financialexpress.net or visit financialexpress.net for more information. Adele, uh, mama, very... Uh, yeah. is- is this your fir- is this your first X Y activity since uh, since having a kid? So that's right. I think I was pregnant at the X Y Christmas party last year. Right. Heavily, so I won't be pregnant this year. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're here at the very last of uh, the the fifteen part All Advisor Plan Produce Profit series, where uh, we talk about three pillars of, the, of a of a great advice business, which we spoke at the start about um, plan, which is create a compelling service offering, then produce, run your business efficiently. And now we're rounding out with profit, which is all about getting your message out to the masses. And uh, and that's something that you've done insanely well. So uh, super, super stoked to be uh, wrapping this one up with you. And you'll be pleased to know that it only took me 13 podcasts to figure out how to do audio for podcasts. So uh, maybe this one won't suck from a from an audio, at least an audio quality uh, perspective. So you're welcome. Um, for anyone that's been living under a rock, Adele Martin, we were just uh, chatting this, adelemartin.com, advisor at adelemartin.com slash firefly wealth slash money mentor. Tell us about your about your um, the, the quick sort of the quick numbers around your business. So uh, how long have you been going for? So I've been going for nearly six years. Team, what's the team you've got in place? So team, I've got uh, three plus myself, so four, and we outsource power planning. Sweet. Um, ooh, can I ask your revenue? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, you can. So we have about 50 clients paying us between uh, five and seven grand a year each. We also have um, our My Money Buddies that pay us, there's 50 of those that pay us between five and 600 bucks a year as well. And then, um, yeah, and then we have our free stuff as well. So we don't have any advertising on our podcast and stuff yet. Cool. So you do, so give me the three part thing that you just, you were just saying. Yeah. So we've got three parts to our, um, to my business. So, and I've developed a personal brand that's been very deliberate and because people trust a person, they don't trust a brand. So I look at all the good businesses in history. They've all of recent ones. They've all had a person associated with it. So look at Steve Jobs and Apple as a, as a classic example. So what I've done is develop that personal brand that AdeleMartin.com. And under that, we've got three ways I can help people. First is that free way. So they get a little bit of taste of what we do. And that's through our um, saving squad. So that we've got a Facebook community, which I built first. And then off the Facebook community, we have our podcast, which we launched about 12 months ago. So if you're talking about how to get to the masses, 
podcast is a great way to be able to get to the masses because you record something once and then you have it forevermore. I constantly am referring people back to that podcast. So, mm-hmm. and people, and, and so it, for me, it's, it's been amazing. I wish I would have done it earlier. So that's our free, all at scale, no one-on-one. So I'm being very strategic in the podcast about how they work with us. So, you know, about, you know, coming, um, you know, download this or join us here or it's, it's not just me talking. It's got some strategy behind it. So I always, anytime I do something, it's strategy. Um, so you've got the podcast. Then we've got our um, My Money Buddy, which is our savings and goals program. So that savings and goals program, I've used MoneySoft as part of it, but white labeled MoneySoft. And on top of that, we use um, a Facebook group as well to support it. And to now deliver the videos and stuff as well. So it is a, um, yeah, it's think Michelle Bridges, what she's done, the fitness. We're doing that in the money space. So it's really around, you know, that's um, creating a savings and spending plan and getting that foundation right. Before, and that program is between five and 600 bucks per annum, before they then work with us one-on-one. So the one-on-one stuff, we've developed a program called My Money Independence, where people work with us long-term towards that financial independence. And that My Money Independence program is our financial planning program where we work with them in a more one-on-one basis. So that's the three ways that people work with us. So mm-hmm. free, a little bit, of, and then, um, you know, paid. Okay. And what, who, are, who are your ideal clients if it's the same or, or different for the different? Yeah, good. That's definitely something that I've worked on. So initially when I launched My Money Buddy, I was getting people with way too much credit card debt and stuff like that. So I want to make sure, yes, some of the people we work with do have a little bit of credit card debt, but they can't be about to go bankrupt. So I have to be really clear in the messaging, the sort of people that I help. And so that's definitely something that I've learned. We don't want to hold people that don't have a whole lot of money in that My Money Buddy program. So we talk about that being the foundation of your house and getting your foundation right. We can't build on your house until we have that solid foundation, otherwise the whole thing will collapse. And that is really getting a really good handle on your um, spending and savings. So that we, when you work with us one-on-one, can more confidently answer your questions. Can I afford to buy this house, go on maternity leave, do whatever, if we, we have that foundation first? So definitely in positioning. But yeah, my ideal clients who I work with typically are in their 30s and 40s. They're earning good money and they're not really sure where it's going. They feel like they should be doing better than what they are, but they're not really sure um, you know, what they should be doing. They've tried to budget before. Maybe they've read the Barefoot Investor book, but they haven't been able to do it and haven't worked. Um, They're often very time poor. And when I looked at my database recently, I realized a lot of them are now self-employed. Either after they've worked with me, they become self-employed or they come to me as self-employed. So I'm definitely seeing who I attract. And that's because my household, my husband and I are both self-employed. So I think that's, you know, you attract the people that you sort of like. So I'm definitely seeing there is a flavor towards self-employment with the clients that I'm working with. Mm. I say, uh, (laughs) I think that the Royal Commission and the Barefoot Investor uh, will probably be responsible for fifty percent of our growth over the next few years because, like the the especially in the younger space, that the barefoot investor is so pervasive. Like so many people have got it's got them thinking about their money, and then mm. you know, the royal commissions showed everybody what they what they should be looking to avoid. Um, so I think it's a good uh, yeah. yeah. And it's put money in the media, which is great. So both of them have put money at the forefront of people's minds, which I think is excellent. So, yeah, I, I want to thank um, the Barefoot because several times I get mentioned in Facebook groups and um, people come to me. I know they're from the Barefoot. Um, either they tell me or the bank accounts I've got set up are called Mojo or called something else. And, mm. and so, yeah, so I, they've had a go at doing it themselves. But most people, the large majority of the people that I work with don't want to do it themselves. They don't have the time. They don't have the mental space to do it themselves. And so they're the people that I work best with, the people that are time poor or they just don't have the mental energy to be able to do it. Yeah, and I think that the like the barefoot the the big gap is that yeah, it's great to be like have a bank account and have you know started doing an investments and build up your savings, but then what do you do? And when you talk yeah. about you know buying a property half a million dollars, million dollars, two million dollars, like uh, you're never going to be able to get that from a book. The book sells well because it's easy to say rules, but when it comes to that those really big decisions, then there's no rule. There's no rule. Yeah, or merging together with your partner. That's another one we work with. How do you do that? So, yeah, that merging of finances is another one as well. Yeah, spot on. It's, it's, it doesn't – more of what I'm doing now is definitely around that life coaching stuff. So I'm positioning the business that where a life coach that happens to do financial planning. That's where I want it to get to. It's not definitely not there yet. There's definitely some things we're introducing in our My Money Independence program to make it more around that life coaching. 
and mm. yeah, and th there's definitely some st stuff we're doing and working on in that space because that you can't replace that. That that's not something that you know AI or whatever could you know take over. Mm. For sure, no, I I totally agree. And so, I'm keen to to dive a little bit deeper into that. But um, before I do, what does a standard week look like for you? Well, the standard week at the moment is working Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. So they're the days that my uh, little six month old son Eddie, he's just started daycare. So he's in daycare Tuesday, Wednesdays. Monday, my husband has him. So a standard day usually kicks off. Um, well. There is no, I'm not getting much sleep at the moment, so it's just uh, I, I get up and be ready to go. Um, uh, this work day starts at 10 o'clock with our team huddle. Um, the Monday team huddle is a longer one that goes for an hour. Uh, the rest of the week goes for a half an hour. I still check in with the team on Thursday, Friday with the huddles as well. We are reviewing our um, what's coming up for the week. We're looking at you know, um, you know, know, our wins for the week, all that sort of good stuff. So we have that longer meeting on a Monday. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, we have the rest of the check-in. I typically try and have three solid um, time blocks a day where I'm in the morning. I try and do my marketing, my sort of, you know, more that sort of stuff or team. I've got an open door time for my team answering questions. We've got that time in the morning. And then um, after noon, I try and have two or three appointments um, the rest of the day. So, yeah, that's typically what a work day looks like. So my work day usually, because most of my clients are young and they want after hours appointments, my last appointment might be 5, 30, 6 o'clock. So I might wrap up for the day about 7. And so, yeah, that's why I start a bit later at 10 as well. Um, but typically I try and have that first morning bit, all team stuff, all marketing, all that sort of stuff, and then two to three appointments for the rest of the day. Wow. Well, you're doing well. How old's your bub? Six months. Is six it? months, yep, yep. He's just gone six months, yep. Holy crap! My uh, little Margot is uh, is she's just about to turn three months this week, and uh, let me tell you, that has been, a, you know, a pretty massive adjustment. I took I took like five weeks off work ish, um, five weeks off client work, but uh, still mm -hmm. checking with the team and you know doing all of that sort of stuff. But I uh, I thought it was tough. But I'm a dude, and I don't have like specific equipment that uh, yeah. drags you into uh, the the heavily the bit of the babying that you get heavily involved in. So mm. um, we're, I, we're doing a mid we're doing a midnight feed at two thirty, three o'clock, and then six o'clock. So we're doing about three. I me and do about three feeds a night, and then um, yeah, it is it is then difficult to bounce. But you know what? I really um, I couldn't see it doing any other way, and that's why today now he's in daycare a couple of days a week. I feel like the Thursday Friday are, you know Eddie and Mummy days, and we can do more stuff on those days, and I make sure I'm definitely more present with doing more activities on those days. But yeah. on those Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's, it's go time for the business. Yeah, and how do you go switching off when they, when there's all obviously there's so much stuff happening all the time? Yeah, and, and it doesn't always work. Sometimes there's opportunities come up to be on certain things, and you know, so I have to do it. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I think that too. I don't know if there's any female advisors listening to this or females listening to this. You know, it's not just me. I sometimes forget. You know, as a female, sometimes I think it's all our responsibility. I forget that I actually have a partner as well, and yeah. so I have to. You know, I had to um, you know tag tag him more in more, and so to say that, you know, to, to have that bit more um, shared responsibility. So, yeah, no, it definitely is um, hard at times and, you know, sleep deprived. But I'm very lucky. My sister lives around the corner. My husband's self-employed. We do have that flexibility, both of us. And so, yeah, we make it work. But it also has really focused, made me focus on my business. And I've realized that it was way too dependent on me before. And so the last six months has really made me build my systems and processes and think about how to do scale even better and how to make it less dependent on me. So, yeah, it's, um, I can see how going forward my role will be that, you know, that CEO role, that governing role rather than doing the do i'll be you know the person that trains the advisors and gets them set up uh and yeah so eventually i want to step back even further yeah awesome yeah i think it's one of the one of the good things and it's sort of i feel like you and i are somewhat alike in in our approach to um, i think clayton said i was the the girl version of you is what how clayton described me <laughs> yeah that's what adrian said that to me as well he goes because i'm like all about the you know I'm like these women with all their, and I'm probably, you know, obviously I probably shouldn't say this stuff or I'll probably say it the wrong way. I mean, but, um, <laughs> but the woman power, it's like you go rah, rah, you know, woman thing. And I think that if you're a great advisor, a lot of them are all about that woman card. Um, and it's a massive, like, it's an awesome marketing opportunity. I think like for, because women are like, you know, women stuff. I don't know. As I said, probably definitely not saying that right, but 
Um, <laughs> I, know, I know what you mean. But I have had some people come to me. I, I never thought about it before because, to be honest, I don't really see, you know, a gender thing. I, it's never, it never really occurs to me because it's such a male industry. So, I've, I don't know. I've never really thought about it. But people have said to me, I wanted to come to you because you're a female advisor. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. I, personally, I would just want to go to the person that I thought was the best. Uh, and so that's male or female or whatever. But, yeah, no, I've definitely had more people. They feel more comfortable. I think they feel more comfortable, you know, from a, I don't know if it's a trusting point of view, but I understand them more. I know how much they need to spend on looking good. And I know we have to have that conversation with their partner. I know that it costs them two and a half grand a year to get their eyelashes done. So uh, that's the sort of detail that, yeah. That is outrageous. Yeah, so we had that conversation because, like, and so I think from that point of view, I definitely have had several clients come to me saying, I, "I like working with you because you're female." Mm. Well, I, what I was get, what I was sort of getting at with that is that I, I think that it's some one of the things that I've found from having a kid is that it forces you to actually do some of the things like you're talking about that you go, "Shit, I need to backfill for team and um, mm. uh, you know, create a business where you can actually have a have a bit of a life like the normal other humans out there." Um, is, exactly yeah which is cool and I know for me that we're you know fast forward before we got married and we're starting to plan to have kids it was just Yang and I like 12 months ago it was Yang and I just hanging out just uh, doing some financial planning and uh, it's like you go crap I'm okay well this is probably not sustainable if there's a kid in the mix so unless you're a Del Martin of course um, <laughs> therefore team back to team figure all the stuff out and, and do the thing so but also um, as I was saying before I think before we started um, recording if you want to have a bigger impact, it can't just be you. And so if you want to help more people, if you want to have a bigger impact, for me, I have to grow a team. I have to invest in the team. I have to grow the team and I have to have systems and processes. And whilst that had definitely hurt the profitability, uh, you know, this year investing in a team before we actually need it all, it, yeah. you know, I can see where we're heading long term. And so I know where we're heading and I know we needed that team now. Yeah, totally. And where did you get your, you decided an operations manager, you were saying? Where, yeah. How, did, how, was, how was that? So there's a place called, I'll probably get this wrong, I think it's called Virtual Placements where they help you, uh, it's an Australian-based you know, um, assistance. So I actually looked through there. I put an ad on, uh, not Seek, but the um, Indeed. I put an ad on Indeed. The quality of the people was pretty slim, to be honest. And yeah. so it took me a little while to find her. She, uh, she actually has her own business called uh, Maximum Efficiency. So she helps businesses get, you know, um, systems and processes and all streamlined. And so she actually comes in, does that as well as she's going to be, as well as doing the operations as well. So yeah, definitely was a, a cost and investment, but thus far it's, it's going really, really well. And I can see why we need that role, why we had to have that role mm -hmm. and why that, why that role is going to be crucial to getting it to that next stage. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, nice. Well, I look forward to hearing, hearing about how that goes on the next podcast. Yeah. Um, but keen to chat today, like get into the some of the detail around, uh, you know, how you how you've gone about getting your message out to the masses because you just sort of glossed over a whole bunch of stuff at the start there. Um, you know, we run this Facebook group and do bits and pieces, but um, talk us through like the Facebook group itself is massive, right? Like you and I know that yeah. the, the engagement le levels are insanely high as well, which is definitely something that. Um, I think everybody would, would like to, to, to have that pool of people that are sort of, uh, you know, understand your philosophies that connect with them and then also engaging with them on an ongoing yeah. basis. So tell us a, a, a bit about that um, firstly, but also just like the sort of the, the progression in terms of the different things that you've done and, and how you've evolved to, you know, the way that you're running things now. Yeah, so for me, when I think about something, I think how can we do this one-to-many or how can we automate this process? So a lot of the stuff that you do with a, a client one-on-one, -on -one, you can actually do in one-to-many. So I have been thinking about that from a, a free group but also in our, our paid community as well. So I've got, I manage three different Facebook groups. So I've got our free one, the Saving Squad. We have very good engagement in that group. We've got the My Money Buddies, um, which is our, um, you know, the five, six hundred buck one. To be honest, we don't do a whole lot in that and there's definitely more I'd love to be able to do. But what I realized last year was I felt like I was giving way too much to all the people coming on board, the new people or trying to attract new people. I actually thought I want to just do stuff for my clients, for the clients that are already paying me. I want to make their experience great. So I started using a Facebook group just for the paid clients. So that's the My Money community. 
and yeah. everything we, everything we do inside that community is we've had special guests come on talk about different stuff. If I think about you know um, you know at tax time we had an accountant come in to talk about stuff. But we've had more life coaching stuff in there. We're getting them to introduce themselves when they come into the community as well. We're getting them to talk about what they're working on. That is something I want to. Um, I was doing a financial book club in our free group in the Savings Squad. I want to now transfer that to the um, to our group to the My Money community. I want to be able to give more and more to the people that have um, put their faith in me and have, you know paid for me because I feel like if I do that even better and give even more value, not only will they stick around for longer, um, but they'll also refer and tell more people. So yeah, I've been thinking about doing stuff on mass and how I can do that more, and definitely been concentrating more on giving value to my current clients. But inside the fa Facebook group, we do some um, the free group, the Saving Squad. We do some cool stuff as well. So when clients come on board to that, at first I always try to direct them to my website, AdeleMartin.com, because I'm trying to capture two things. I want them to hit that website so I can um, have a Facebook pixel, so I can then retarget them ads. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I want to know my Google Analytics. I want to know where are people are going on the website, um, and then also I want to capture their email address so I can remarket to them. So I don't talk about Facebook group when I talk about the clients. I say, come and join our squad, get up-to-date money news, hang out with us, join the savings squad, come to adelmartin.com. So they go there, we do all those things on the website, and then we get them to join the Facebook group. Uh, when they join the Facebook group, we then have a little mini chat camp, um, chat with them. So mini chat is a Facebook messenger. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, so we, we do that with them. I ask them a series of questions in a really cool way, and they all answer them. So in a really cool way as they come on board, um, and then um, once they're so then I've got so much data about them. I know if they're single. I know if they're you know if they want to talk about investments or they want to talk about saving or debt. What is it they want to talk about? That stores in my CRM Infusionsoft. It tags all the information. So then I know how better to market to them. So yeah, that's when they came in. And then when they were in the group, the first week, once a week, we send them a um, we do a welcome shout out group on a Friday, welcoming our new members and getting them to tell the community what they're working on. So that worked really well and most people actually talk and, you know, I was surprised. I thought if we do this, I wonder how hard it's going to be. They actually do, they tell you what they're working on, which is really cool. And then it's my job to interact. So that's part of my job is to be that community manager, to interact with them, to do that, um, you know, chatting, all that sort of good community management stuff is what I do inside the group. So liking stuff, saying that's awesome, can't wait to see you smash the credit card debt, whatever it is, I'm doing that engaging. So... We also do a regular thing in the group called Tight Ass Tuesday, where and then once a week, once a month, we pick a winner of the Tight Ass Tuesday. So we've got prizes, and we do we do cool stuff inside that community. And then what we do is four times a year, I run a, a money masterclass, a webinar online where we are promoting my money buddy. And so we've been do, I've been doing that now for several years. My conversions are always about twenty percent. So twenty percent of people that come to that webinar will buy. And I'm promoting that to my database, so that Money Masterclass. And we're doing that four times a year online on webinars. And that, to me, is a fairly good conversion. When I tried to do that strategy to a cold audience, I thought that worked really well. I did it to a cold audience that didn't know me, hadn't built up that trust inside the group. It failed epically, like really badly. So um, I think I wasted about 10 grand on Facebook and Facebook ads um, really? sure. with a strategy that had zero return. So absolutely no one turned up to the webinar. So I actually thought there was something wrong with the links and everything like that. No, nah. that people need to know, like, and trust you, yeah. particularly in financial services, before they'll make that commitment. Yeah. So that was a massive mistake that I made. And so, yeah, so I just keep doing what I'm doing. Direct people to the savings squad, nurture them, love them, um, send them regular um, cool emails. And so that's something we do every month as well. We send emails as well. We've got over a 50% open rate on our uh, email. And so we're regularly doing that, as well as the cool stuff inside the group four times a year, money masterclass to the saving squatters, then converts them into financial planning clients. Oh, so the 20% conversion is from is from people in the $500 program to the $5,000 program? No. So the, the five, sorry, no, good point. The my money buddy. So become my money buddy, the 20%. And then from there, I would say probably another 20% um, that have come to, from the my money buddies that then come across. So Oh, so to, into, the, into the $500 one, you're yeah. saying? Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. So 20% for that. We run those money masterclasses that sells to the, my money buddy program. Yep. What I'm actually thinking about testing and measuring, and this is everything is testing measuring, but something that I've thought about is I actually want to just go from webinar to financial planning application. So I want to go to that straight to that, my money independence program and then push sell down. I know everyone talks about selling up and, you know, having this, you know, 
buy a little bit and then sell up and, you know, that does work. But I also know the people that need help, that stops them getting help as quick as they can. So what I'm actually thinking about doing is um, going straight to my money independence and then if they can't afford it, pushing them down to the other one. So making it more like that. Um, and we're going to test and measure whether that works and what that looks like. Uh, and so, yeah, that's something we're doing next year. We're building in our marketing for next year now, but we will have four events a year that promote the My Money Independence program and, you know, that talks about the fact we can only take on 10 people a quarter. And so do you want to be part of our 10 a quarter, um, have an application process, take on the 10, um, and if they, can't, if they can't afford it, then we push them to My Money Buddy. So that's something I wanted to do next year. Um, yeah, with that is, is test it the other way. Awesome. And so did you, so tell us though, like how did you, obviously you've got this engaged um, community now. How did that, how did you start? Like what was the, what was the thought process? Why did you end up on Facebook? Mm. So I guess I was in other groups for things. Uh, and I, I don't know, I, I had, I've always invested in mentors. So I've always worked with a mentor. Um, yeah. And so um, oh, I saw a guy called Karen Ray and he was doing it um, obviously really well without the group that I was in. And then I went to FinCon, um, and when I went to FinCon, I saw a lady over there, the budgetista, and I saw her doing it, and I thought, oh, I was doing it a little bit, but not really, and then I really upped it. And then it was all around, oh, my job is community manager. How do I be community manager? And so I saw Kerwin doing it. I saw people at FinCon, the budgetista doing it. Yeah. And I thought, how, how can I do that and do it better? Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's how it started, and it's, it's grown from there, and now what's happened is they also look after themselves in that group. So they ask questions and they support each other, which is what you're wanting. So yeah. it doesn't take a huge amount of maintenance. Um, you know, it doesn't take a huge amount of stuff from us. And that's something that I probably go too much of those groups initially. And so I think about now I think I go too much. Now I want to give that to my community, my clients. And that's um, definitely something we're working on is how can we add more value, not one-on-one, -on -one, but one-to-many. When I was having the um, financial book club inside the Facebook group, the free group, the engagement was off the hook. People want to learn about money. There is this hunger, this thirst for knowledge. And so I want to take that and do it inside my, my group where people are already paying me. And so I think that will be an amazing um, value add to my clients is having a monthly book club where they, we can riff and talk about it. Even if they haven't read the book, we can still talk about it. Yeah. Awesome. And so, um, like, when if you think back, because obviously there's a lot of people out there that are like, you know, we'll just start a community and we'll start a Facebook group and then it'll blow up and we'll take over the world and all the things. But, you know, obviously, you know, not ev like not everyone has the, the, su the success that, that you have, uh, that you've experienced. So what do you think, what was the, what do you feel was the biggest factor that led to that success? So for me, I would do this even if I didn't get a cent from it. Even if no clients come ahead, even if I, I won the lotto tomorrow, I would still do the groups. I just, for me, I love doing it. I love, I love learning something and then teaching it to somebody else. Um, and so, but I don't love teaching one-on-one -on -one because for me, for, for me personally, I found, you know, doing a lot of personal development stuff over the last few years, I found I'm actually quite introverted. I know I'm, I'm outgoing, but outgoing is different to being introverted. So yep. doing stuff, a lot of stuff one-on-one -on -one actually quite drains me. And so I, I've learned that now. I learned that doing stuff one-to-many, um, you know, still gives amazing value to the clients. They love it, but it doesn't have to exhaust me in the process. And I then can turn up and do more stuff and be better and learn more and give more because I'm not exhausted doing 5,000 appointments a day. So, yep. yeah, that's definitely something that um, I've looked at. So, yeah. Um, yeah, for that, so I would do this. That's probably the biggest thing. Even if I didn't um, make any money from it, I would still do it because I, I enjoy it. I love doing it. And I love people saying to me they've been able to do pay off their credit card, they've been able to do something, um, and they haven't, even, they haven't even become a client. They've just seen something, read something, listened to a podcast, and they've been able to you know, um, have an amazing impact. We've been able to take a holiday for the first time ever without going on the credit card because of listening to your podcast, because of your Facebook group. Ah. Um, so yeah, that, that is why I do it. That thanks, that reward. Um, and you know, for me, I think you have to have that intrinsic motivation because to start with, you're going to get crickets. And so yeah. if you get crickets, um, it's really, you just, it's consistency. You have to be consistent. So doing the same time, same thing each week, like for six months, 12 months and before you tell me it's not working. So people do it for a little bit for a, you know, a month and no, it doesn't work. Well, you have to be consistent with it. And you also have to, you know, know to pivot. Well, maybe this doesn't work at this time. Maybe at this time, um, what can I do to get engaged with it? Or ask people what they want, what they know more about. 
So that's why that mini chat camp questionnaire is really good to start because I can know what they want more about. Yeah. And what and so was is that what it was like when you when you kicked off? Did you find yeah, that crickets. Was building engagement? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was crickets. Crickets for a bit. Yeah, definitely crickets. And then I tell you what, I probably tipped it too. The the, the um during the books tipped it, but prizes and giveaways. Uh, I think people the, the the comments that we get on Ty last Tuesday, we can get twenty comments at a time on a Tuesday or more. And so, you know, for not paid, it's, it's quite great engagement. So they're giving away their prizes. And again, it's how do I do that on the podcast, wherever I speak. I do a lot of PR stuff. So I can talk about how later yeah. how I do PR because that's another one of those ones, one to many. When I'm doing PR, I'm being very strategic about it. And so they're coming back to the Saving Squad. And then on the Saving Squad podcast, I'm talking about, you know, Tight Ass Tuesday. And I'm cross-referencing Tight Ass Tuesday you know, for your chance to win, make sure you comment in the group. So everything I do is sort of cross-relating it over each other. Um, mm. It's not one particular thing. So, yeah, I talk about in the other things, in the other places that I am, other PR and things like that. I talk about it on the podcast. Um, but also, to start with, yes, it was cricket. It's consistently showing up con- um, consistently. And if you do that and if you give amazing value, people will keep turning up. Yeah. I, th- I find... <laughs> I've had a, a, probably a different experience, although definitely uh, in listening to you, that one of the things that I, I didn't do that well when it came to trying to create the engagement is to, to stick with it for a long time. But I remember doing giveaways on like Instagram and stuff. I couldn't even get people to comment on the fucking giveaways. Like I want to give people yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, in, I, my Insta- uh, interesting. Was this on stories or on a pay- post? On a post. Okay, so I definitely find stories is where I'm getting huge engagement and huge opt-ins to things. So, like huge wanting to... A lot of my clients last month or so ago were coming from Instagram stories. And they've been consistent doing it every day and having a strategy behind it. So people are really smart. And they know if you are giving away that it's for something and they do something or whatever, you have to build that trust for, with them before yeah. you get them to do something or give an email or do something. Because they're, they're switched on and, oh, you're just going to market and spam me forever. So, um, yeah, when, with Instagram, with stories in particular, I'm building up a trust by doing it every day. And, yeah. and then I'm having – I get really good engagement on polls and stuff on Instagram, like really good. So, um, and I think it's how you do it too, making it in a fun way. So, yeah, yeah. Instagram stories in particular, a huge success this year. Yeah, wow. Well. And how do you plan your content for that sort of stuff? Yeah, so I, I plan it out a month. I try to do a month out. And so that's why I'm not thinking of what I have to do that day. So, and some I'm getting better at. I want to take what I've done on the stories and do it on Facebook and Instagram pages because we, we post every day, but it's not with a lot of strategy. So what I've done on stories, I want to then do on the rest of it as well. So, um, yeah, for me, it's just that thinking about what do I actually want to do. So, like, for instance, it could be stuff like reintroducing myself because people in the stories may not know me. Um, so I was reintroducing myself. It's it's sharing a client win, and I'm so excited for these guys to pay off their credit card. It's tagging the client, obviously getting the permission first. They're tagging the client in that. It's it's sharing things like you know, um, you know, I work with me Wednesday. What do we do on Wednesday? Um, it's it's all that sort of stuff and having strategy around it. I find theming each day. If you theme each day, it makes it easier. So if I have a, a regular thing we do on this day, it makes it easier to plan out. So yeah. every Wednesday we have a work with me Wednesday, or every. Um, you know, Thursday we drop a podcast episode or we give a podcast quote or whatever. I find you have consistency with it or once a month or once a fortnight, you know, reintroduce myself. And, yeah. you know, you're learning the quizzes and polls and engagement. So I did a probably one of the best ones, well, best engagement ones was, you know, I did a five-part series, How Well Do You Know Me? And I thought, oh, it's a bit, it's a little bit wanky telling people. But people loved it. They wanted to know, you know, um, and I was surprised I didn't know the name of a financial planning program. I talked about my money buddy so much. I haven't really talked about it, And that was like, I need to talk about the my money independence program more because they got that name wrong. So, yeah. but they knew that I had a baby. They knew how long I'd been in the industry. They knew they answered my majority was going to answer all the questions. And they loved it. So I got, you know, I don't know, so 50 people doing a quiz about me. And so, yeah, having that strategy, planning it out, having to try to theme your days up. Um, I think, you know, building up that trust before you then ask for anything. And what did you what did you give these people for the uh, cert for they they're doing a quiz about you was that a no, they didn't get they didn't get anything for it they just we just did it online. you know how on Instagram stories you can um this you know can do polls and stuff not really okay so you can do polls on Instagram stories you can do quizzes on Instagram stories um yeah. and so yeah um if you do that on Instagram stories then they that they just get those engagement and you just know more about them so I've, I'll try and I've, um while we're chatting I'll try and bring up some of my 
better Instagram story ones, which ones were the most engaged. But uh, honestly, if I wish that I would have started Instagram stories much earlier, I'm glad I'm onto it now. But it has been very successful for me in terms of building up that trust mm. with with the community because they see you as a real person. But it's not plates of this is what I had for dinner. No one cares about what you had for dinner or what you're having for breakfast. It, 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 it's with strategy behind it. So let me just see some of the ones that have been um, the most popular. Uh, but, yeah, keep going and I'll, I'll do this while you do that. Um, if you've got any other questions around um, how I do PR and how I've done that, you know, yeah, on maths as well. Tell us about because I know you, you've done a fair bit in that space. So what what are you what are you what are you running now and and uh, how do you make it happen with the PR? Yeah, so I do a regular gig with ABC Kalgoorlie every week, once a week. So which is great. I love working with coal miners. I come from a coal mining town, so I really love doing that sort of stuff. So because yeah. I earn good money, and it doesn't take very long for you to be able to have a huge impact on them. So yeah, that for me has been working really well. I saw a lot of stuff the ABC actually. I was actually, Instagram is how I got featured on the project this year. So I was on the project from Instagram. So that definitely having Instagram, uh, journalists are using that more and more to, to source people. I'm finding more people using Instagram. And so I've had several opportunities from that. So yeah, lots of that sort of stuff. You know, the Australian Financial Review, I, I regularly get featured. I've been on Mama Mia several times, um, you know, which for the clients that I work with is really good. Uh, for me, how do you do that? The first thing I always tell people is make sure you've got a really good profile of yourself. So, you know, the awards that you've won or where you've been featured or, you know, have that speaker kit, that speaker bio, your pictures, everything really good. So I've worked on that and got that really good. And then, you know, start with something called Source Bottle where you can start to basically journalists go to Source Bottle and they pick, um, they're looking for people. They need news items. They need experts. And so you register for free, your details with Source Bottle, and then when an opportunity comes up, you're replying to that journalist. So when you reply to that journalist, firstly, they're very time poor, so make sure you do it quickly within the deadline. Think of it like a job ad. So apply, put that, that profile that you've done in yourself, the picture of your bio, attach that to the Source Bottle article. You've got to stand out from everyone else applying. So I did that to start with. I then developed some relationships with the journalist off the back of that um, because I got back to them quickly, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and um, if I can't help them, I go find someone. I said, do you need a client for that? Let me go to the saving squad. I went to the saving squad. I find people. I find stories for them. So I then became super helpful for, with them. That then meant when they go, you know, maybe they stay at this place, maybe they move on. Journalists, you know, sometimes work for different people. I then just keep building it up. And so now what happens is when it gets to, you know, certain times of the year, I'll actually go to my list of journalists and pitch them story ideas. Um, you know, so I did that in the new year. I do that, you know, throughout the day because I've got that relationship. Or throughout the year because I've got that relationship. So, but you have to build that up to that. So, and having a good profile on Instagram and that sort of stuff definitely helps. Um, but getting back to them quickly, these guys are time poor. And if I can't help them, I'll find someone else that can help them. And what does that lead to then? Like the, you know, in terms of the PR, what are some of the, the results that you've had off the back of the, those different things? Yeah. I wouldn't say you do one thing on the project and you get a thousand clients. It doesn't work like that. But I do know when I get mentioned on something because I get 20 people join the savings squad in one day and I'm like, I must've been on something. Uh, and so, yeah, so that, that definitely happens. Um, radio, national radio has been great for that. And when I, when I do some of the national radio stuff, I see it increase in the savings squatters. So, yeah, I definitely think it has that correlation. What I did early on, like years ago, I wasn't very strategic about it. But mm. now, and you have to be very careful sometimes, you can't you know, sell or promote yourself. But I can say, that actually, um, inside our Facebook community, the same is God, we blah, blah, blah. Or actually, um, on our podcast, we go into more detail. On our podcast, the same is God, we go into more detail. So you can be strategic about it. You mm. do eventually find clients from it. But I do know that it definitely sees an increase in... Um, traffic inside the savings squad when we do that national stuff so and then also for me how i can use it better is when i'm about to after i go live each week with the abc you know this week now they're going to start to tag us in their posts so it, it does help with your you know if you your google analytics and google searches and all that sort of stuff it definitely helps get your name out there in terms of that uh, yeah. so it definitely helps with all that stuff as well yeah awesome and so tell me like what what um when you when you think back at the different stuff that you've tried and 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 worked through, what is are there, are there any things that you can think of that um, you were really sure were going to work and just uh, didn't? Apart yeah. from, apart from the, uh, the, the the Facebook ads, 
Because I had the stra- I had the strategy right. I thought webinars worked, but the webinars didn't work because it was to a um, cold audience. So that didn't work. What I also found is what I was doing is I was selling from stage a lot. So I was, you know, selling from stage. I could not for the life of me get people to convert. And I'd go to all these other events from stage and I'd see people selling and people doing it. I couldn't figure out why they were different. So I spent a lot of time, you know, thinking I'm not going to do any more stage events because no one's going ahead. This is before I was doing webinars. People aren't buying. I don't want to have like a whole of first appointments and no one go ahead. So I spent a lot of time on being able to sell from stage and I, I changed one piece. And this is what I tell, I, um, I often will work and mentor advisors and when I'm mentoring advisors, you know, sometimes I get a bit frustrated, but I know that sometimes you could be one thing away from huge success, one tweak. And mm. so I changed the last page. I added some bonuses. I overcame the objections before we got to the objections and I had 60% of the audience buy. So I think I had... 12 people bought a $1,000 first appointment from stage um, by changing that last slide. Wow. I, want, I didn't even want to do this event because I'd been doing it for three years and no one ever bought. It was a waste of my time. And I, had to, I had to, like, use, sometimes I had to fly there or drive there. It's a day out of the office. There's, yeah. an accountant going, there's an accountant going on after me. They'll just sign up with him. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to go. And then, um, so sometimes you can get in that real negative headspace. So what I did was, you know, talk to myself, what could we change what's one thing how could we improve what could we do uh, and change it and then I was like how many forms have we got I was like wow people you know basically I was charging for that first appointment and yeah, yeah for me that was um yeah really testament to the fact that you can be one little tweak away from having success but previous to that I was doing all these events and wasn't getting any clients and I was getting frustrated and what do you put that down to to putting some bonuses on the final page of your presentation yeah, so no, making making it, yeah, so making it call call it something cool. It's all about packaging. It's all about how you package yeah. something. So calling it something cool. So I would call it my business accelerator program. So let let's have our you know, um, and so I would say, and it's how I broke it up. So your business accelerator, you might get two times thirty minute strategy sessions or whatever, or whatever you want to call them, um, yeah. or discovery session or whatever. And then you might get um, X, Y, Z bonus with it. So uh, I might give away my money buddy as a bonus to them if they sign up on this one. Or I might give um, my ebook about, you know, what questions you need to ask your accountant away with it. Or I might actually give someone else's book away with it. So Profit First. I love, love, love the book Profit First. Um, So I might give that away as a bonus. But those sort of bonuses, they have to sign up on the day, um, you know, to be able to get that. But I'm also very conscious of what might their objections be. So one of the things they introduced was a 30-day money back, no questions guaranteed. So if for some reason you're not completely happy, no dramas, we, we're still buddies, we're still part of friends, you get your money back. So, um, yeah, that's, that's one objection they might have. So I'm thinking about how can I overcome their objections. So they might say, I don't have time to do stuff. So if I know objection is going to be time, throughout the presentation I'm saying the words like, this is super easy. Um, you know, this is going to be quick. Um, we, the clients we work with are time poor, so we make sure it's easy, quick, blah. So I'm thinking about how to overcome those objections before it's in the head. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely something that I work with is packaging, making it sound cool, having bonuses. If they act, so I say, listen, I love to work with people that take action because I know my action takers are the ones that get the results. So for those people that want to take action today, I'm, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z bonuses. Yeah, awesome. And and so, uh, wow! I'm just like those numbers. That's uh, that's amazing. It's making me rethink the 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 uh, the approach with with some stuff. But um, what? So let me ask you on the on the sort of the the the, the flip side of the um, of that question. Is there anything that you found that really that worked really well that you weren't expecting? Hmm. I didn't think the bonuses would convert. I, I didn't think the bonuses would convert that well. Uh, I, I didn't realize it would have that big impact. So yeah, the two bonuses, and because I think sometimes what happens is you overthink stuff. When you think about stuff too much, you're using that real analytical part of your brain. You talk yourself out of doing stuff. But most people don't do that. They make decisions quickly with the you know the front part of their brain. You know they're called crop brain or this. I'm sure there's some more scientific words for it. But that front part of the brain doesn't doesn't process. It doesn't think. It just it, it just wants things to be easy. And so sometimes I think I've been really guilty of overthinking stuff. And so overthinking it is the killer of marketing and sales. And so um, yeah, for me, 
that that yeah that that surprised me. The bonuses, how that worked work so quickly, surprised me. So yeah, that that definitely something that surprised me as as you know that they would act so quickly just because they had the bonus. But also the objection, the thirty day back money back guarantee, having that thirty day back money back guarantee. Um, the other thing I introduced payment plans. So I actually thought the payment plans. This is funny. I thought that introducing a payment plan for my money buddy would get more people. It didn't get more people, and in fact, more people. To still do the upfront, so um, majority of people still do the upfront. I, I'm always surprised by how many people with my money buddy take the upfront rather than the payment plan. So it's five hundred dollars upfront or three payments of two hundred dollars and one hundred ninety-seven dollars. And so they always, the large majority, take it up front. So I'm very surprised about that. Like giving them the option means they feel like they have a choice. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's something that I, I've toyed around with as well. Um, but so, do you actually you offer the money back guarantee on your introductory meeting? Both. No, I'm, I, I, even on the financial planning clients that sign up on the My Money Independence clients, I say we've, we've got a very standard process that we go through. If after 30 days you are loving it, you've got anything, just give them the money back. Right. Okay. And do so you they, they're never, they're never going to do that. We wow them. We, they love us. They wow us. And if we're not doing an amazing job. Yeah. Okay. And so, right. So you've never had anyone uh, ask for the money back? No, uh, actually, from that that for the thousand buck one, I had one person ask for a refund, um, and that was they didn't meant to talk to us yet. I think they just realised that they they wanted the money back or whatever. Um, so that was in that, but we hadn't even done any work. But in the financial planning clients one on one, no, because now this is what's amazing about doing stuff at scale. Some of them have listened to twenty six hours of me talking on the podcast. Yeah, they've listened to they've listened to all those episodes. So the time they come and see me, that's it's, a lot of that is a lot. I think it's too much. Um, so um, the time they get to that, they're already they're already ready to go. So me taking one of their objections off the table. Listen, guys, if you don't absolutely love this after thirty days, I'm going to absolutely give you money back, no questions asked. And mm. quite frankly, we haven't done a huge amount of work in those first thirty days anyway. It's a lot of data gathering stuff and that sort of stuff. Um, so we have like our onboarding um, process, but we set them up on my money buddy. They're already on it. We do a few stuff, so we would last, we would lose money. But for me, it takes an objection off the table. Yeah, that's mad. I'm definitely going to implement that. I have toyed around with it. I was like, I wonder if you get people that would just waste um, no. time. So we have, a, we have a 15 minute phone chat, which then goes to a paid $200 meeting. Um, after that $200 meeting, straight into an engagement agreement, straight into them paying. Yeah, man. I love it. I love it. I love it. I'm in. I'm in. I will report back on that one. Think about, think about you as a client. You don't know this person. What fears and anxiety do you have? How yeah. can we make it easy for them to say yes? Because I know that if they work with us, particularly if they work with us for the long term, they're going to be much better off. So let's make them be able to pay for it monthly. Let's make them have a money back guarantee. Let's do all the things to make it easy for them to say yes. Because I know once they start working with us, yeah. provided they put in the work, yeah. I say that, provided they put in the work, I say, it's a bit like going to the gym. Just because you do have a gym membership doesn't mean you're going to be fit. Um, so yeah, they can't you know, say that. But if they're going to do the work, I know they will be better off. Yes, for sure. Awesome. And do you have, I'm just getting my own personal tips here. So, you know, um, yeah, go crazy. Uh, but it, 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 are you putting conditions on that thing? Like is, no. do they have to show you anything? Nothing. No, no, I, I don't, I, it's only 30 days. Um, yeah. so if they, if I, if, and think about them, oh, but totally no. if you guys are completely happy, totally understand, um, you know, we'll give you the money back. No questions asked. We're still, we're part of buddies. I say that. So we'll still be buddies. We'll still be friends. No dramas. Yeah. <coughs> All right. That's great. I love it. Um, tell me, what do you think, like when it comes to this space, where do you think that, where do you think most people go wrong? Um, I think most people go wrong because they try to often learn from other financial advisors. Advisors <laughs> need to look out or outwards at other industries to see what they're doing and then apply those to us. So yep. I, I take a lot of inspiration from fitness. Fitness do scale well. They do scale very well. Um, they do that one to one to many really really well. Things like Michelle Bridges, all that sort of stuff. You know, they've made fitness a huge multi billion dollar industry. So yeah, all we're gonna do is look at other industries, how they do stuff. You know, how do other places do technology? How do they use technology? Why can't we do that? Even life coaching. So that's why I've been looking at you know life coaching businesses. How do they scale? How does someone scale a business in life coaching? So you know, I look at how other businesses scale. So life coaching school. This is where I got the idea, you know, some of the idea from. I'm going to be the one that, you know, people, you know, that key person of influence where people are initially attracted to. 
but I can only help so many people. So yeah. I'm going to be training the other coaches and the other um, money mentors and they're going to be the people that work with the client one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm going to be the one that does the big picture, that one-to-many stuff, and then they're going to see the, the advisors. I'm going to have different specialties and experts. So if they're a small business, they get our Profit First coach. If they're a, um, someone that's a single, maybe they get one of our, um, you know, maybe a female advisors because we work with a lot with single clients. So have each person with a different specialty, and then my job is to train and mentor them so they can be the best advisors that they can be. And so, yeah, I definitely learned that from life coaching school. They've got one website, and then you pick the coach that you want to work with. So I'm like, well, that's awesome. Why can't we do that? So, um, or even how we sell. Why do we have to sell one on one? Why can't I sell from a webinar? Why can't I sell from, um, you know, why do I have to have a physical office? I don't have to have a physical office. Um, I can do stuff virtually. So my whole team's virtual. My office is virtual. So, but if I was only looking at what other advisors are doing, I would never have done that because other advisors told me that people won't do virtual. You have to know you. They have to shake your hand. They have to eyeball you. you to, they'll never sign up to a seven thousand dollar fee. Um, if they uh, um, if they don't see you, um, which is absolute rubbish. So I think that's the biggest mistake that people make is just listening to their own industry. We need to think outside the box. We need to look at other industries' inspiration and what they're doing. Mm, totally, and I think uh, you. I think you're absolutely right. And it's you know um, in this we're in this interesting transition uh, phase. In uh, well, we've been in transition for the last sort of you know coming up to ten years, but. Um, yeah, why would we? Why would we look at what we've done in the past to figure out how to be awesome in the future? Clearly, that's uh, that's that's not the way. So, um, but yeah, I, I I love that. Um, tell tell me what um what's next for you when it comes to your you know your your uh, increasing your leverage and getting getting the message out further. So I really want to continue with the podcast and continue back with Instagram stories. I want. I want to absolutely master Instagram stories and podcast, and I want I want the podcast to, to get in front of more people. So I've got I've got a strategy around how I'm going to do that. So next year I want to make sure I get on other people's podcasts because that's going to give me the opportunity to cross back to my podcast. So the other podcasts have to be uh, complementary. So maybe I'll get on a health podcast. I think getting on other people's financial podcasts doesn't necessarily help your financial podcast because people only listen to so many financial stuff. They might only have one or two that they listen to. So my strategy next year is to get on other people's podcasts to then get uh, more listeners to our podcast and then, um, you know, promote that. So that's definitely one of the strategies. Next year I'd love to be able to also do more um, employee programs. So I'm noticing this year I've had a few people come to me and they want a workplace program. So, again, I love that because it's mass, one to many. So I actually have next month I'm, work I'm talking to 600 coal miners. So I'm doing a program and that's paid. So that's going to be a paid program, but they, they give me the ability to be able to pitch as well. So we might have a you know particular um, My Money Buddy or some sort of deal that they can do uh, through that, the ability to pitch to them. So that next year, I'd love to be able to do more corporate stuff. I'd love to be able to put together a work, you know, a money wellness program or whatever, because I know that if people, you know, suffer financially, you know, their mental health suffers, they're more sick leave, it, you know, has a, a huge impact or people leave because they want, think more money is going to help them when if they just control their finances that maybe they'd be happy to, where they are. So yeah. I know there's a whole heap whole of stuff in that space that I work with with corporates putting together that wellness program. Again, that's another scaled option. That's one to me. So everything that I want to do next year is all around removing myself from the one-on-one -on -one appointments and being able to, you know, um, do that stuff one to many and that's definitely going to be through the corporate program and also building out the podcast more as well as well as regularly showing up on Instagram stories love it sounds like a busy year coming up <laughs> yeah but again you do it once it's one to many yeah so yeah. it does the, the, the podcast it, it does feel like it but you do it once it lives forever and so yes. yeah if I can do something really well and do it a math rather than imagine if I had to have 600 one-on-one -on -one appointments with the coal miners I would be exhausted yeah. Um, and so being able to you know, do everything in that one to many space, I think, you know, is definitely makes it feasible. Awesome. Yep, totally. Um, tell me what, if you could go back to the start, what would you do differently? Mm, what would I do differently from the start? Oh, I would have went virtual earlier. I didn't really like working in an open plan office. That didn't work for me. Uh, I would have let go of some of my staff I had earlier. So I, I've been a bit... Uh, I always think that, oh, people will come around, we'll be able to fix it. I would have let go of people much earlier if they weren't working out. Uh, that's a lesson that I, I'm constantly learning. 
and I pay for that from you know mistakes that they make. I, I end up you know having to wear those. So that's definitely been something we we'll let go of people a lot earlier. Um, and I would have really niched and had an operations man. I would have really thought about having an operations manager earlier. So yeah, the other thing I would have done is, um, which sounds really obvious, I was doing so much organic stuff, but people I wasn't asking for a sale. So one of the strategies that I, I, I listened to a guy called Frank Kern. Um, he's a really big internet marketer. And it occurred to me that I was never asking people to buy anything. So I just thought, oh, I'll just test this. I'll just put in my Instagram stories. I'm having a 24-hour sale on my money, buddy. I wonder if anyone will buy. Yep. So I think I had three people or four people buy. Um, and I was like, wow. I just never really regularly asked for a sale. So that was something that I you know, definitely would have done earlier is regularly ask for a sale because people just think, oh, I didn't know you actually do financial planning or I didn't know you actually do stuff. So I'm yep. asking for the sale more regularly. It's definitely one as well. So yeah, I would have got rid of the virtual office, physical office much earlier. I would have saved myself a lot of rent doing that. And then I would have been able to reinvest that. And I would have um, had those more uncomfortable conversations with team members much earlier. And I, yeah, definitely would have um, asked for sales more often online. I love it. What's your top tip for for team other than fire people quickly? I feel like that. What's the top tip for uh... my 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 um one of our values that we have in the team is we value open and honest communication. So because we have that as a value, it's not just something on the wall. We actually live and breathe it. Um, because of that I can just say, listen, you know, one of our values is open and honest communication. This is one of those times. So uh, I just um refer to the value. Also, each time we have a um a huddle, I talk about the fact that. If you've got an issue, something that you go home to bitch to your partner about or your friend about, I want you to bring those issues up in the meeting. So I make the team huddles a really safe space where people can actually bring stuff up. And so because of that, often I have very valid points about me. So often I have to, you know, swallow humble pie and go, yep, that's, that's very true. I have done, you know, blah, blah, I need to, blah, whatever, better. So for me, um, having that, creating a space where you can have open and honest communication, where people feel like they can trust you, they can bring problems forward. So when I do, you know, let team members go or reposition them into other roles or whatever, um, it's always with love and with, I've never, ever had an issue um, letting a team member find another opportunity because we have this open order communication. They really, you know, they often come to me and go, it's not working. I keep making the same mistakes and I feel like I'm letting you down and, you know, um, and I'm like, okay. So because we've had that open communication, that sort of exit becomes, you know, easy. Um, one of the other values we have is extreme ownership. So, that's definitely something where we, there's a great book called Extreme Ownership. So I really recommend everyone um, read that. But one of the values is I don't blame anyone else. So I, I don't want to hear my advisor talk about blaming power planning for something um, because I say, well, hey, what's our value? Extreme ownership. What role did you play in this? And so, and, and then I do the same with me. So admin stuff up, what role did I play? Um, how am I responsible for this? So rather than pointing fingers, we always look to have extreme ownership. And what that does is when we do that, it diffuses a lot of the situation because we start to go, you know, we are all human. We do sometimes make mistakes. And, you know, if, we, if I take responsibility as the owner, as the, as the you know, the buck stops with me and I take responsibility, people all of a sudden, it calms the situation down. So very, if I think back to how I, you know, initially came into, you know, when I was in a team environment years ago, that was not the case. There was, you know, our admin team versus advisors and the advisors were always screaming at the admin team and there was always this tension and yelling and um, the advisor would never have accepted responsibility for anything. In fact, he was always blaming everybody else. So um, I always think that that honest communication with the team, having extreme ownership as the, as the boss, as the one um, doing that and having an opportunity, a safe space where they can come and, and say, you know, this is what I've got an issue with. And um, sometimes it creates amazing opportunities to learn. And I always say, that's the other thing we do is, Never, no one ever makes a mistake. It's just a learning opportunity. So if they make a mistake, come to us, we'll fix it. It's always learning. No one's ever going to get into trouble. It's a safe spot. It's always about learning and how can we improve and what can we do differently for next time. And so I think creating that space, having clear communication, regular catch-ups like this every day, virtual map meeting where I can see the team, they can see me doing this every single day, having that communication I think is key. I love it. I've just been making notes while we go here. So I'm just working on my team rhythm, but I've uh, definitely got a few tips there uh, that I will. <laughs> uh, well, Adele, I could, uh, I could keep chatting with you all day, um, but I know that you've uh, you know, got babies to, you know. It's feeding time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a couple of just super quick ones before you go. Biggest oops moment or stuff up? 
Uh, that Facebook one, 10K, that hurt. $10,000 hurt. Yep, okay. Uh, best piece of advice you ever received? To trust your intuition, to, to trust yourself. You don't necessarily need to have um, advice from everyone else all the time. Trust yourself and trust your own intuition. Love it. It's a surprising how often that one has actually come up. Back yourself, trust yourself. Mm. So, no, so there you go. But to do that, you really need to be um, tuned in. So for me, I have to make sure I'm in a very calm space. I do lots of walk outside. Outside centers me when I'm outside, it centers me. And I can yeah. make decisions um, more easily when I'm centered. When I'm in a bit of a flap and need to balance something and blah, 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 that's because I'm not back to, I'm not focused. I'm not like calm and centered. And so I go outside, get some fresh air, go for a walk around the block. And then I'm somehow it's magic. I, I can make decisions much more clear. And having that, knowing what I'm working towards. So knowing that even if, you know, I know what I'm working towards, I know the impact we have, I know that we have to get out there to help you know, the next generation, that they're not going to have the age pension, that they're not going to have the safety net. Um, I know that I don't want them to work to retirement. I want them to love the life I live now. I don't want them to work to retirement. And so I keep reminding myself of my why and why I'm doing this and, and how um, important what we do. Um, that really helps me as well. Well, I, uh, you know, you talk about getting cut through with the with the message, and I think uh, you know pa people want to work with people, as you say, but uh, passionate people, and clearly you've got that in spades. So, uh, my very final question for you is: What is your spirit animal? What is my spirit animal? Uh, spirit animal? Maybe a cat? <laughs> is that can I be a cat? Cats just get to lay in the sun; they sort of do their own thing. Is that is that what you mean? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's just a... Spirit animal? You're not really... What? I feel like it's cats are... What, what has everyone else said? You're the, you're the opposite of lazy. Oh, I'm not lazy. I'm an energetic cat. I'm they're definitely not... Like, people say I'm not... I'm um, high energy. Maybe like a... A puppy? I don't know. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> uh, but no, you have to pick, Adele. You can't think about it. I, I, I have to pick a, an animal. What is my spirit animal? Just oh, a wolf. A wolf. A wolf. Yeah. Okay. I, just, I, 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 I like, I don't know, I think they, um, I don't know, I like, I don't know if I, I, I'm not cool, but I think wolves are cool. Um, they're a little bit, a little bit uh, stealth, you know, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe a wolf. <laughs> I'll work on that for our next podcast for my spirit okay. animal is. <laughs> nice one. Well, thank you very much uh, for anyone that wants to reach out. I suppose you're not really pitching to financial planners, but um no, I do have a few ways to help financial planners. So one of the things I've realized is I speak at events like this and advisors get super excited, but then they actually don't do anything. And then they hear me speak the next time somewhere and then they don't do anything. So one of the, I've worked on a program where I actually work with dealer groups. And so I've got uh, a few things at the moment where I'm actually working with dealer groups. So if you think, I want to learn more about this stuff, how can we do some of this stuff? Talk to your dealer group, get them to reach out to me. Um, I have a program that I run particularly around marketing to actually get you doing something in the marketing space, not just talking and thinking about it. No more turning up to a webinar, no more going to an industry event and actually not taking action. The program that I've developed actually gets you to take some action. Awesome. So we'll put a link in the show notes to somewhere. Just stay off the website so that pixel doesn't track you all around the, the interweb. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Cheers, Adele. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to catching you guys at the Chrissy party. Yeah.